Hey, Monica, how's it going? I'm good. How are you, Bobby? Oh, you know, living the dream, playing the host right now, subbing oh. in the Ferrari. You get to be our esteemed host this week. Thanks to Maddie's. Chris, how are things in your world, sir? Uh, you know, busy, the usual, but uh, but well. That's a good thing. It's the short answer. Tracy, how are you? Tracy's like, I'm getting my water right now before this call starts. Kimberly, how big is that dog in your picture? <laughs> she She's quite large. Um, she's only actually about 70 pounds, but she's very tall. Um, and I'm about 5'10", and she can stand up and put her paws on my shoulders. <laughs> wow, she's like a model she's, she's, dog. Thank you. Yeah, she's, she's pretty similar to like a, a German shepherd size. She's basically a, a tall and skinny all-black retriever <laughs> she's yeah, basically like a wolf hound or something yeah that's what i was thinking monica and i'm the cat yeah she she's a oh yeah yeah she, well, i have cats too but yeah she's a she's a, a shelter pup and she's got some german shepherd um retriever and then a little bit of standard poodle which i think plays into her height that is very interesting hi april hello How's it going? It's great. Good stuff. We'll give it just a couple more minutes waiting for the amazing uh, Kelly Dewar to get here as well. And then we'll get it kicked off. Monica, are you um, the only one today or do you have some co-hosts? It is just me. Cool. It's all we need. You're the expert. Expert is something. Well, we got Amy here too. Amy, Amy's going to dive into the cat conversation, I'm sure. Good. I love cats. All about community cats. I just got back from Puerto Rico um, and counted personally, not work related, but was counting ear tip cats all around all San Juan. It was super, super excited. And they were all ear tip, which was great to see. That's so exciting. Million Cat Challenge in University of Florida. I'm sure you know they've been doing the mass yeah. spay neuter clinics out there. It's so exciting. And yep. for dogs too, not just cats. Yep. Hey, Kelly Dewar. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm going to uh, make you literally the co-host, and then I'm also going to kick it over to you to do an intro for Monica. Sure. Um, we um, have Monica Friend in here today to talk to us about community cats and um, everything <laughs> um, about, about cats. We're really excited about it. Um, so... Monica, if you want to get started. Yeah, thank you everybody for being here. Um, every time we, we talk about community cats, it seems to take over the conversation. So we figure we're just going to have some summits and talk about cats. So we can talk about community cats, we can talk about cat cats, we can talk about whatever kind of cats you want. But uh, for those of you who I don't know yet, my name is Monica Frendon and I am the Maddie's Director of Feline Lifesaving here at American Pets Alive um, and Haas. And we do a ton of work in our community cat work group trying to um, re-envision animal sheltering for cats. And a huge component of that is of course, community cats. So um, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen and if it works, it does. Okay. Let's see if I can hit play. Okay, can you give me a thumbs up, Bobby, that's working? Great. So um, this is just a little bit of what I've been working on this last month as I work with shelters all around the country and rescues and organizations and volunteers and, and kind of big picture what I'm looking at. And what I've been really busy on lately is pathway planning for cats. And ideally pathway planning begins before cats even enter your shelter. And so I'm gonna borrow from Million Cat Challenge pretty heavily. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about navigating the feline superhighway how it relates to pathway planning. 
um, how exactly we do that and what we know about outcomes. So we're gonna keep this really brief. It's just only six or seven slides because I really want to just open this up to conversation because I know there are so many questions out there um, about community cats. And as we change the landscape for how we shelter cats, um, everyone's got a ton of questions. So we will have lots and lots of time for discussion. So pathway planning general guidelines. And again, I'm borrowing from Million Cat Challenge here because they've really dialed it down into an easily digestible system. That makes a lot of sense. And they use this feline superhighway model that you can see on the right there. And it's very simplified. And these are for outdoor cats, how we plan their pathways. The general guidelines are that for outdoor cats, social kittens under six months, we know we want to fast track them to adoptions. No one's losing any sleep over those. We all feel good about bringing in kittens and getting them into indoor homes. So that's kind of an easy one. And that we know for outdoor adults, we want to fast track them to return to home. And I'm going to say regardless of temperament. So two things in here, you'll notice I said return to home, not return to field. So if this is your first time hearing me talk about this, um, as, a, as a movement, we're, I'm pushing the use of return to home versus return to field. Or I think we do, and I want to do, um, you guys put in the feedback if you think this will be helpful or not in the chat. I'm considering a webinar on the language that we use for on cats, which might be accidentally harmful to them. We have a lot of it. So things like return to field, it conjures up this image that we're just dumping cats in some meadow, pull over on the side of the road, you find a nice field and you put them back out there. It, it doesn't paint the correct image of what's actually going on. They, um, April said, I always hate return to wild. Yeah, so, um, and community members have no idea what RTF means, right? Return to home makes a lot more sense. They're going back to their home, wherever that is. Indoor, outdoor, they're, they're going home. Home is also a much more digestible and friendly word that connotates what we're really doing. And so those of you are, um, those of you on the call who are getting pushback from um, people who don't like cats, they want us to round up all the cats and, and euthanize them or whatever. They're very good at using some of these terms that we have accidentally brought upon ourselves and using them against us. Um, another one is colony of cats. So not only does the word colony have some, some DEI issues um, in talking about colonialization, um, but the word colony kind of conjures up this idea that you have like, 200 cats all congregating in a parking lot and it's just swarms of cats. It doesn't conjure up a great image and it's not accurate as to how community cats actually live. So um, there's some harmful language that we've accidentally introduced in our field. Um, and I think return to field is one of them. So I like to do RTH, return to home. I think it's a much better representation of what we're actually doing, bringing cats back to their, to their outdoor home where they're, where they're thriving. So kittens under six months, we fast track them to adoption. Adults, we fast track them to return to home. So obviously there's always going to be some exceptions and some, some um, off ramps here and these are but a few of them. There are no black and white answers um, for really any of us in this industry, and uh, certainly not for cats who can be really elusive. But these are some of the obvious ones. Um, if the kittens are unsocial and reasonable efforts to socialize them are not realistic or not humane, um, it's perfectly acceptable to consider them for return to home. They might deviate from the superhighway. Um, and I like to put that the efforts are not humane in here because I would ask that everybody keep that in the back of their mind when we're trying to socialize um, unsocial cats. At what point does that become not very nice to continue trying to do to essentially a wild animal? Um, and I know that everybody on the calls probably got experience with house ferals or cats living under the bed forever. So keep that in the back of your mind when you're making this quick decision um, at intake. Another off-ramp might be that your organization's capacity simply cannot absorb those kittens on the adoption path without over, overloading your shelter, um, without causing the euthanasia of existing cats in the shelters. Now you must bring in more. So in those cases, the kittens might not, they might take an off-ramp and not go back down the superhighway. Um, genuinely abandoned cats, lost cats with identification, those are not going to follow the return to home path. Those are going to follow the adoption path. They're going to take a different route. Same thing with cats with significant medical conditions. They're not thriving in their outdoor home. There's something that's significantly impacting their health 
that affects their ability to continue thriving outside. They would take a different off ramp and not go back down that superhighway. And then you've got the cats who uh, the return location is unsafe. They can't be returned for some other reason. I mean, their habitat's been destroyed. Um, they're in a sensitive ecological area. There's a bunch of reasons why sometimes cats simply cannot go back home. Um, and so the superhighway, again, would have an off ramp for them. Um, owner surrender cats, we know that those are gonna not be returned to home. And of course, hoarding case cats. So you can see that we've got the two superhighways, but we're making off ramps and exceptions on a case by case basis so that we're making decisions individually for each cat that comes in. And you're gonna start asking how in the world do we do that? So pathway planning does require quick but careful evaluation of the individual cat situation. No community is the same, no cat is the same. And so how do we do this? Um, and I hear my, my folks working on, on the front counter and answering phones all day long. Um, we're already slammed. How in the world do you want us to do this? Evaluate every single individual cat and make the correct decision. Ensure that we are admitting the cats who need to be admitted and returning to home the, the, the cats and kittens who need to be returned to home. So on the right is a um, intake, cat intake form that I made with Oakland Animal Services, the amazing, amazing team out there in Oakland. Um, and we took basically two or three pages of cat intake forms and we evaluated them and said, how can we, how can we get the staff empowered to make these good decisions and quickly without bogging them down? We want them to get the information that they need and be able to get it quickly. And so this is the case with a lot of our organizations. We ask a lot of questions that really don't give us answers that we're looking for or might've given us the answer a few years ago, but they don't apply to what we're doing in sheltering anymore. And this took us, it took us a while and we brought in, we brought in the, the customer service staff and we brought in the animal protection officers and we, we really sat down and said, what do you need to know to make this decision? And so you'll notice this is a one pager, which we love. It's down to one page. And you'll notice that pretty much every question on here is open-ended, it's conversation-based. We're not, there's no yes or no answers to this. We have to have in-depth conversations with people to get a really good feed on the situation in order to make that decision. And so um, why did you bring in the cat today? The cat's a nuisance, explain. The cat needs help, explain, or other. And notice that we didn't give them any leading information. I don't wanna give them check boxes and, and lead them to an answer that I'm looking for. I want to know what they think is going on, right? I don't wanna give them the answer that I'm looking for. So do you know anything about this animal's history was our way of kind of doing that. Like, I'm not going to put neighbor abandoned as a checkbox or, you know, I'm not giving them the answer. I want you to tell me what you know about this animal's history. How long has the cat been in the neighborhood? So we put that there because if they come back and say five years, this is easy. The cat's fat and happy. He's going home. Um, is someone feeding the cat? Are there other outdoor cats in the neighborhood? So again, we know if there are other outdoor cats there, they're probably there because there are resources um, and if this cat is looking fat and happy, that gives us a lot of good information. Um, is this cat welcome in the neighborhood? So we changed this around from like, do, can we bring the cat back? Because um, again, they may just like, no, I want you to keep it. They may have a million other reasons for saying that, no, I don't want you to bring the cat back. But is the cat welcome in the neighborhood? We thought that that would give us a good indicator of if it was a safe environment for the cat. He's not in danger. No one is threatening harm to him. Um, and then we asked, what has changed that you've brought this cat to animal services now? If he's been there for a while, what's going on now that's different? Has the, has, is the neighborhood being redeveloped and housing being destroyed? Um, is someone threatening to hurt the cat now? Is it injured? If, what's happened now that's different? We thought would give us a bunch of really good history and information. And then you've got the can you touch hold pickup. Um, we asked, did you have the animal in your home? If so, for how long? Because a lot of people, as you know, they, they, they find cats that they rescue. And so we wanted to know if you've had this cat in your bathroom for the last three months, we need to go back and look at lost found cat reports for the last three months and make sure we can reunite if someone is missing their pet cat. So we wanted to get that information so we could do pet reunification on a, on a high level. Um, any issues in your home? Did you take the animal to that? Did you post flyers? All that kind of fun things, um, things that we need to, that we do need to know. But we really condensed this down um, from, I think it was three pages of, of information that the staff was like, oh, I don't even read that question. I don't even read that question. Um, into, into a one pager that we felt really kind of encompasses 
the history of the cat, the unique situation that the cat may be in, the unique situation of the presenter. Um, and without leading them to an answer that, that we're looking for, but allowing them to really fill us in on what they think is going on and gather good information that allowed the staff to make really good, quick information. Um, so this, um, Hillary in the, in the chat, this is specific to stray cat intake. So this is specifically the stray cat form. Um, and then once we, once we kind of got this intake form down, our next step was creating these flow charts and decision trees that are unique to the organization and unique to the community. So every org is gonna be a little bit different on what your priorities are, what your pathways and your super highways look like. They, oh, there's, they're following the same trajectories, but there's nuances, right? Nothing is black and white. So for example, this organization bringing in pregnant cats is a high priority for them. They want to get them spayed before the, the cat gives birth. Those were a real priority for them. They said, we've addressed that as a target in our community. We need to prioritize them. We need a decision tree that incorporates that. So you can see, um, starting on the left, these are the four super highways for them. Green, yellow, orange, and red, in their, it's triaged. And so their urgent priority was the sick, injured, pregnant, unsafe cat in any situation. And the flow chart goes, give the presenter resources. And the presenter is either gonna take those and do the things or they're gonna reject your help and then we schedule intake. Healthy, safe kitten, is it indoor or outdoor? Is it with mom, not with mom? Um, will the presenter take our resources and maybe bring those kittens in the home and foster them? Or is that a hard no, get these kittens out of my bathroom right now? Healthy, safe adult cats, we're moving down the triage list, right? Are they indoor or outdoor? What are we gonna do? Will the, will the presenter accept, accept help? Um, and then you have owner surrendered cats, bottom of the triage list, provide resources, they're either gonna do it or they're not. So we've taken a really complex situation and kind of boiled down into um, a high level decision tree that should allow staff to make those decisions pretty accurately and quickly. Um, and again, it's gonna be unique to your organ. It involves sitting down, we sit down with stakeholders, rescue groups, partners, and we also, what are the individual and unique needs of this community? What do you want to see happen? What do you agree is appropriate? And we boiled it down. And so um, part of my work that I'm, that I'm focused on is, is creating a universal flowchart that everyone can start with, orgs can start with, and then you build in your little nuances if you want. Um, and I think that this is hopefully going to allow us to make those, those pathway decisions really pretty quickly, really accurately for getting really good information at the onset. We're having conversation based um, interviews with people who are presenting. And then we've got clear SOPs and protocols in place, decision trees like this, that, that let your staff make those good decisions. And at any point, should the community cat person on your staff or the medical director or whoever say this cat, it cannot go home. Of course, that's always an option. Um, this is a quick flow chart and decision tree to help help your people make good decisions pretty quickly. Um, yes, Chris, I will share that decision tree with you too. Absolutely. And so um, those of you who know me, um, I am a giant cat nerd and I love science and um, Dr. Julie Levy, who many of you assuredly know, she's one of my personal heroes, sent me this last week. And it is a study that really validates this superhighway model. And um, the, the link, I've got the link that I can put in the chat as soon as I stop screen sharing, or the name of it is on the bottom here. It's called um, Association of Neutering with Health and Welfare of Urban Free Roaming Cat Populations. And this study looked at about 5,000 cats that had been TNR'd or SNR'd or RTH'd and um, it tracked their outcomes. <clears throat> and what the study showed, kittens have really high rates of emaci emaciation, illness, and injury. It supports the superhighway path that they need to go on the adoption track. We need to bring them in, get them help, they need to get on the adoption track. It showed us that neutered adults, however, were, had markedly higher rates of not just being fat, they were obese, um, and they had um, less illness or injury. They're doing okay. Um, however, and I found this pretty interesting, the adult cats had higher rates of um, disfigurement or disability. They were missing eyes, legs, tails. Um, however, they were still doing fine. They were still doing fine despite having had like an amputation or an enucleation um, or ha having some sort of limb removed. Um, and Dr. Levy was joking about limb removal. Um, but I thought this was really interesting and validated these adoption paths that the kittens need help. Um, but the adults are doing pretty good. 
so what the takeaways were for me for that that we need to focus on the kittens um by reach and, and the superhighways validate that too by saying if we return the cats who are doing great we have more capacity to help the ones that data is showing do need us and those are the kittens so of course leave those with their queen if at all possible then bring them in for adoption spay mama um, this paper again one of thousands that is now validated tnr it's working it improves their health um, we know that adults are doing well you should return them home with with gusto and enthusiasm they're doing well we've shown it again and again um, and uh, I almost borrowed this quote directly from Dr. Levy, remove limbs and enucleate as appropriate and return. They're doing good. So don't hesitate too bad about returning a cat if you need to make him a tripod or a cyclops. They're doing good um, and you can feel good about it. So that's all I've got on a presentation. Um, I'm gonna see if I can stop screen sharing here. There we go. Um, and hopefully get to some of your questions and whatever you wanna throw at me about community cats or cat cats um i don't know if kelly if you've got questions already or if you want me to scroll back through chat or if people just want to unmute and ask um either way um chris fitzgerald um did you want to ask your question sure I, I, you know i think monica and i've already talked about it a little bit but i think i think it helps to you know for folks to understand we've been hearing messaging for months now about tips for people who find animals and, and whether it's a community member or a, uh, a local cat group, you know, I think that there's uh, confusion about what to do when they have a, a lost cat, quote unquote, lost cat, um, relative to those reunification tips uh, versus the pathway planning for a community cat. Yeah, loss, loss, and this is a really good question and we're gonna be tackling this uh, as part of a, a, a new Haas work group too about applying really all the elements to cats because lost pet reunification is radically different for cats than it is for dogs. Um, it's a completely different model. And so what, um, what we know, um, and Brittany just had that great, that great study that she's doing that had that fabulous information that showed that most cats were found within six houses away of where they had gone lost from. Um, we know that lost cats behave completely different than, than a community cat. They hunker down, they only come out at night. They're, you know, um, very different behavior. And so what we're, what we're putting together is that you need to flyer the heck out of your neighborhood. You need to knock on doors and talk to your neighbors. And the other, the other thing that cats kind of uniquely have against them in, in being reunified with their owner is that the public just brings, rescues cats wildly. Um, if you look at how most people get cats, most people found their cat and brought it into their home versus adopting. It's the number one pay, way people have a cats in this country. And I wonder how many of those cats are actually stolen or lost or abandoned cats or um, you know displaced cats that, that were someone's cat before they rescued it and brought it in. Um, so the flyering, um, knocking on doors, talking to your neighbors because we now know that the cat is probably within six households of yours and knowing how lost cats behave. That means looking under bushes, looking in cars, they're hunkered down, they're in the dark, they're only coming out at night. Um, it's, it's much different behavior than, than lost dogs. And so what we're gonna be doing is going back through kind of toolkits and adding in a lost cat component of really, here's what science tells us of what you should do if you've lost a cat or if you found a cat that you think might be lost. What should we do on both ends that's very species appropriate. Um, and there's some good good info out there. There's some lost cat detectives that exist that do this professionally. And um, but that's kind of what we know about lost cats. And it's we what we don't want is to bring them into the shelter or assume that they've been lost or abandoned. Um, that's big. I think we're all very familiar. Everyone assumes that a cat you see on the sidewalk has just been abandoned. Oh, the poor thing. It's probably not. You know, do we want to scan it for a microchip? Make sure she's spayed or neutered. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, but then we need to develop that toolkit that says you've lost or found a cat, boom, boom, boom. Here's what science tells us is our next steps based on the species appropriate model. So um, we've got some preliminary data on that, Chris, but it is next up on my to-do list. Amy, did you wanna ask a question? Sure. Um, I feel like return to home, if I'm positioning myself in the, kind of like in, in putting myself in the shoes of average community member isn't necessarily into animal welfare, doesn't know all the nuances, like could return to home as a concept be misconstrued as 
an option versus returning it to the home, which could be an alley or, you know, kind of like a, a, a garden or a field. I think in people's minds, like home is like an actual house indoors. So I don't know if you've had any feedback from the public on, on that, on return, the return to home concept. Yeah, it, it is deliberately, it's almost deliberately confusing because we have misconstrued the concept of home, I think. Um, and I am forever challenging my students and, and the rescues I work with that you need to reevaluate what home means. Um, we have to, I, I, part of what we're working on is how do we change, how do we drive this culture shift so that people do that? And they start to think of community cats differently and accept that the outdoors is their home. And so part of, I feel like my responsibility is pushing that agenda. So I know it's confusing. I might be deliberately confusing the public a little bit and making you rethink of going, oh no, the behind the dumpster is the home. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. Yep, you're right. Um, and, and driving that forward. And it, it's going to be a little confusing. I can absolutely say I haven't gotten any pushback on it so far. Um, and it's, it's kind of being rolled out by, by all of us who are building SOPs and protocols and toolkits and whatnot. But um, I think I'm deliberately confusing people on it. And I know there's going to be some, but I think it's, it's one of those things that we got the term wrong to begin with. And we've done that a lot with cats. We've done it a lot. Our entire model of sheltering has been not great, not, not necessarily what we would do now. Um, so yeah, we're deliberately driving that long, our long. And in fact, if you're interested in that kind of like how you change hearts and minds and, and behaviors, I'm doing a webinar on June 17th with um, Deborah Cribs, who is with um, Joni Bernard Foundation. And they've done a, a massive multi-year marketing campaign dedicated to culture shift about the way that Cincinnati thinks about outdoor cats. And we've got, we're building the presentation right now and there's amazing stats, but the whole thing is gonna be about how do we drive this national change in the way we think about cats and where they live and how we treat them. So that we start developing that culture in this country of I see a cat outside, I'm not going to round her up or, or, or you know, call the cops or I'm, I'm going to go get her scanned, I'm going to put up flyers, I'm going to go knock on neighbor's door, I'm going to do the, I'm going to go get her spayed and neutered. How do we drive that culturally? So that's now our accepted way of thinking about cats. So yeah, June 17th, that'll be a whole, a whole webinar if you're interested in that. Good, I'm glad that that's a topic that people are, international, I'm sorry, Kathy from Canada, international, you are absolutely right. Yeah, we will post that sign-up link soon. Um, Hillary, did you have a question? Yes, sorry. So I kind of have a two-part question. Um, I'm not particularly familiar with acclimating a cat to like outdoor um, living. So let's say somebody has a cat that they've been feeding in their neighborhood, but they're moving neighborhoods. And how do you sort of counsel on bringing the cat with you to your new location and reacclimating them versus leaving behind and hoping that the cat's still cared for? Yeah, um, most people are calling because they're moving and they're not bringing the cat with. That's the one I'm most familiar with. But um, as someone who, I, I grew up in, in working cat programs and barn cat programs, that was kind of how I started cutting my teeth in this industry. So I, I'm really familiar with relocating um, feral or unsocialized cats. Um, and I also moved from Chicago to Texas with 16 of my own barn cats. Um, Cause I was one of those crazy people was like, I'm not leaving my cats, my community cats behind. Um, what we know about relocating is it's really, really, really stressful on those cats. Um, I think we all know that on this call, but it's important to reiterate um, that it's very stressful. It breaks up the bonds that they've built in the community, the little kitty bonds. Um, they do have families and family structure and it breaks it up. And it, keep in mind that when, when a, maybe you took the alpha male out of that, that group of cats and now another one moves in and he's bullying and beating on the others. Things like this, you know, happen or one becomes depressed and quits eating, you know. So we do break apart that family structure. It's very, of course, feral cats do not do well in confinement. They get sick and stressed. We all know all these things. Um, but if you're going to relocate your cat, there are great ways to do it um, and mitigate those risks. Um, and I'll speak to a, a working cat kind of aspect because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, I've done, oh gosh, well over 5,000 working cat placements um, in my career. And from day one, because I'm a data nerd, I, I track the long-term success of their, if, did they stick? 
at their new home. Um, and we would send out, we still do 30 day, um, 90 or three month, six month and one year follow-ups with our working cat adopters. And we've been able to kind of extrapolate that a minimum of two weeks in confinement. And we have about a 75% success rate. If you bump it up to four weeks, we have a 90% success rate at six months later. Um, and so that for us, that, and that's what we tell our working cat adopters, minimum two weeks in confinement, we like four weeks best. Um, and then I've done, I had a grant from Best Friends years and years and years ago. I was convinced that if you fed the, 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 wet, the cat wet food twice a day, he would be like, oh, this place is great. I'm totally sticking around. I'm not gonna leave. It had no correlation whatsoever, none, none, zero. Um, so the, you can tell people, yeah, you can do it do it really thoughtfully um, and are, do you really need to do it? Um, or is someone else in that community actually caring for those cats? Um, I think we've got good data out there now that shows so many people care for community cats and they often work in the shadows. They don't make themselves known. You may not see food bowls. You may not know who they are, um, but so many more neighbors are caring for community cats and feeding them than we are aware of. So if you are gonna move and you can't take them with, that's always my first piece of advice too is, who else is around that can help? Odds are someone can. And we've had instances where the person who's moving said, I'll continue to have Amazon ship you a bag of food a month. Can we do that? You know, um, So there are always ways to kind of, that I try to mitigate it. My first choice is to keep Cat in home where he, where he is in his current habitat. Um, and again, habitat is another word that I don't like to use anymore because it conjures up the, cons the conservation argument comes up and it sounds like the cats are invading habitat. So that's another one of those that I, I'm trying to get away from using and catching myself in bad habits. But um, my first choice is leave them in their home where they at, see if someone else can absorb care for them. Um, but certainly if someone wants to take their cat with them, I understand that completely, I've done it myself. Did you have another part to that? You said you had a two part question. Well, I guess the two parts was the taking with versus leaving behind. Yeah. So those are the two parts. So I think you okay. answered that for me. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Hey Monica, I have a question for the group. Um, for the folks that are operating shelters or working at shelters, I know we, we're talking about this is a shift of culture, but I think it's there's also the conversation between internal and external culture. So like obviously the conversation with your community, but also sometimes that conversation with your staff, if your staff is even on board with this shift. Um, if you want to use the chat or anybody wants to speak up, like what do you think the ratio is of having to change the minds of your community versus still having to change the minds of your staff that this is the right way to do business. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, and I know from looking at some of our, our host data that staff um, resistance is still an issue for a lot of a lot of organizations um, where we have to change that mindset within our own staff. Yeah, for sure. Is anyone still having any staff pushback a lot? 70-30 from Chris. Um, and, and, and Kelly, you may have thoughts on this too. Kelly, Kelly on this call has, has taught me a lot about the importance of uh, using the term pilot program. And that's helpful on getting staff buy-in that we're just gonna try it. We're just gonna pilot something and see how it goes. Gets a lot more buy-in from your staff and we're just radically intaking our cat program, um, especially with cat people, because we do not like change. We do not like change, just like cats. Um, but so Kelly can speak a lot about how to how to phrase this as a pilot program to get staff buy-in, and then you can keep kind of coming back. Well, look, thirty days later, our disease is way down on our on our cats in care. Their length of stay is way down because they're not fighting. Um, they don't have so much competition of of adoption interests. Um, instead of cleaning cages and medicating sick cats all day. You can work on behavior modification programs with them, or you can socialize the kittens. You can, you know, um, hopefully they, they start seeing some benefit. They start seeing cats reunited with their families when we return them to home um, instead of separating them from their families. But we do have a lot of training um, for sure to yeah. do with staff. Charlotte, did you maybe want to share um, how you typically handle that conversation with your staff when they're concerned about uh, friendlies? Hi. Um, yeah, part of the problem is that there's not been enough explanation, I think, both in the community and within animal care staff in general, that 
cats that live outside are friendly. Some people are under the assumption that only cats that we can we continually call feral are cats that live outside and that we rarely talk about cats that are friendly living outside. So most of the questions come up when someone brings in or when an animal control officer brings one in and we might have it on hold for a few days. Maybe we have to do some medical treatment and people see the cat as friendly and soliciting attention. And then we say we're gonna return it. Um, and people raise concern, which is just is fair. I appreciate that because sometimes with so many people involved with one cat, we may not put all the pieces together. Um, but that's usually the concern. We have not done enough to educate people that there are friendly cats that are community cats as well as truly feral behaving cats. I just had um, a great video that was produced by one of our volunteers about DC's community cats. You can find it on the HRA uh, YouTube page um, where I, we went out intentionally to film cats that were somewhat friendly with their caregivers um, and shoot that as a representative of DC's community cats. I don't like continual use of cats and traps. I think that gives not a complete picture of cats in the community. Um, so I encourage everyone to talk about this when you talk both with your staff and in the community that just because they're trapping them doesn't mean that they're not friendly. It's just the best way to handle them with someone who they don't know. Um, but a lot of these cats are really very friendly and those are the ones people want back. Too many times I've heard from people in the community after we've been out or even years later, you, somebody came and stole all our cats and didn't bring them back. And that's not a good message to hear you're not being perceived as being humane or being um, helpful to the community when that's the way they feel. Yeah, Charlotte brings up so many good points. Um, community cats can absolutely be friendly. We all know it on this call. I've got several that I've taken care of in my life that are friendly, um, but cats might be outside and fine even if, if, you know, how many of us have indoor outdoor cats or strictly outdoor pets and they're friendly and those would also get rounded up in the old model um, and brought in. And a cat may be outside, um, maybe a community cat or maybe an outdoor cat for a variety of reasons too. Um, maybe it has house soiling issues, aggression issues. Um, there's a lot of good reasons why a friendly cat you may see wandering down the street. Um, and it doesn't mean that that cat is lost or abandoned. That should absolutely not be our assumption that a cat is a friendly, it's lost or abandoned or needs rescuing. Um, plenty of friendly cats live outside and there's nothing about a cat's temperament that indicates that she cannot thrive outside either. Um, and so I like to equate this as we are, we are quite certainly stealing people's pets when we are indiscriminately rounding up friendly cats. Um, absolutely. And I'd be, I'd be, um, a miss not to mention too how this disproportionately affects affects marginalized communities who um, may not be able to have indoor pets because of pet rent or a million other million other reasons. Um, we're we're stealing people's pets and we are doing it uh, even more so in, in marginalized and underserved neighborhoods. So um, really important for us to keep in mind that just because the the cat's temperament should not affect its super highway path. Um, other than if it's a kitten or and you're talking, so, do we socialize or not socialize? Um, but friendly cats should absolutely go back. Um, and that is a pushback that, that the community is, that we're hearing across the country. People just don't understand. Um, I want what that friendly cat should be in a home. It should be inside and it should be loved. And I get it. I've heard all the arguments um, and we have to just push back and say it has a home. It has an outdoor home. It's loved. Um, if it was not loved, it would not be friendly. It would be feral, right? Um, someone is paying attention to that cat. It has a home um, and the home may not be the ideal home that you want it to have that you find suitable. Um, but my home is probably not the ideal home or suitable for a whole lot of people too. That doesn't mean I should be rounded up and removed from it. Um, so yeah, the friendly cat discussion is big. Um, it's something that we are, we are hitting home on kind of in all of our communications and pushing out that it is perfectly acceptable. In fact, you should be returning to home those outdoor cats that are friendly and thriving in their environment. They shouldn't be treated any differently than a fractious cat. Uh, outdoor cat. Monica, if I could add one more thing. Um, one thing that's helpful too is 
where you can document you're returning a cat to a neighborhood and somebody in the neighborhood is like, oh, I'll take that cat in. Don't, don't feel bad. I don't know how else to describe it. That you're gonna return a cat that's ear tipped that you've invested spay neuter services in rather than keeping it for adoption because that's really what you've done. You know, you've allowed someone in its community to who may know the cat well to keep that cat and now we're not gonna have issues with reproduction. To me, that is almost more valid than holding onto that cat and finding it a home with someone it doesn't know in a neighborhood it doesn't know. If it's been outside and it wants to get back out, now it get, if it escapes, it's gonna be in a neighborhood it doesn't know with people it doesn't know and no access to food potentially. So I would much rather put a healthy cat back in a community that it knows um, while we meet these other criteria, then hold on to a cat merely because it's friendly, because we think we can find it a new home. Yeah. Um, I'm reading Chris's, Chris's comment. Um, there's a lot of like feral and friendly words being kind of thrown in the chat. Um, but the, we've really kind of confused not only the public with a lot of these words, but um, our own staff. And so I don't think that's helping matters much. I think if we asked every single person on this on this uh, summit right now to define feral, we would get how many people are on this call? 32 different people say that's a feral cat. Well, feral is a temperament. It's a behavior. It's it's not like a breed or species of cat, you know? Um, and so a long time, I feel like people have said feral cats get tea in or feral cats go back. Well, that's just its temperament. That's, you know, a community cat is not a feral cat. They're not the same, you know? Um, so we've, we've done a good job of confusing people and, and I think the feral, for feral friendly argument kind of goes in there somewhere. But yeah, Charlotte, I, I agree with you 100%. Cassie, you had a couple of questions in the chat. Did you want to ask them? Like I wrote them so long ago, Kelly, you're expecting me to remember what they were. I, uh, Monica, I wanted Sorry. to know if you could share the, um, the intake form. Yeah. And also, uh, no, I now have a new question to Kelly, um, just with regards to your last comment about the confusion between community cats and feral cats. I feel that pain directly. Uh, you know, when I'm looking at some of like the Alley Cat Allies uh, web pages and, and they intersperse community cats and ferals. And so me, when I'm trying to make a distinction to people and say, you know, this is what we consider to be feral, this is what we consider to be a community cat, and they're the same species, they're slightly different, you know, in their behavior, to your point, um, but, but whether, like, even when I'm trying to look for research papers, if I look for, um, you know, community cats from a research standpoint, invariably, I end up with research papers that are actually talking about trap, neuter, and return of ferals. So can you whip these people into shape or something, Monica? Come on. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get right on that, Kathy. But it, it speaks again, like we've accidentally created a lot of harmful language about cats. You know, a feral cat is a community cat. A friendly cat is a community cat. It has nothing to do with temperament or behavior. And we've done that accidentally. We've, you know, we've confused the public and our staff in a million ways. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm your comments, everybody's comments and feedback are really helpful because it sounds like you're, you're all in agreement. Like there's a lot of confusing terms and language that, um, that we could, we should probably break down and, and come to a consensus on what we're not going to do anymore. Or those, those ideas that we are going to drive forward as the, the new model, um, so that we get that culture shift of friendly cats can live outside too. They have been for millions and millions and millions of years. Um, how do we push that through on culture, um, public and staff? So good, oh, I'm glad that you guys are interested in a, in a topic like that. We can definitely do that. Did you have a question, Amy? You popped up big on my screen, I don't know why. Okay. Um, Kathy, is that your only question or you got more for me? One of them was um, about um, how soon would you send the cat home after invitation or in, in, in I, can't, I can't even say it, in nucleation? Nucleation? 
Yeah. Um, Thanks, I'm not a, yeah, I'm not a veterinarian, but I, am, I want them out the door as soon as they are stable and ready to go because the risk of their stress and, and illness is so high. Um, you guys all know you take, you do an a new, um, uh, amputation on a cat and they are up that evening. Nothing ever happened to them. I mean, they're such an amazing species. It's incredible. If you took my leg off, like I don't want to see another human for a month. I'm going to sit and wallow and feel sorry for myself. And, you know, I'm certainly not going back to work that evening. Um, whereas, you know, cats are like, boom, let me out of here. I want gone. Um, I don't, I can't fathom it would be more than five days. I can't fathom it would be. And if there's any DVMs on, on that want to pipe in, please do. Um, but man, as soon as you're, you're, you're healed and I don't even mean healed, you're, you're stable, you're stable and that wound is closing and there's no sign of infection and we're, you're, we're sure you're mobile and you're upright. Um, it's time to go. It's time to get back to your home and get out of the shelter. Um, don't get stressed. Don't get sick because there are few worse things than when we have a sheltered feral fractious cat on our hands and now she's sick and won't eat. And now you get to play the fun game of who's going to syringe feed um, the Wolverine in kennel number 32. Um, so out the door as quickly as humanly possible is almost always beneficial for them. In a nucleation, same thing. I think that's even less traumatic in my opinion than, um, than a leg amputation. Um, and we have been returning to home community cats with three legs or one eye for years and years and years in Austin. Um, lots of orgs are now, it's, it's, we know from our, from our community cat working group, lots and lots of, of hospitals uh, tier one and two tier, tier two shelters embrace that concept too. You're not like the crazy lone nut if you're returning a tripod community cat out to field. We're all doing it. Um, and now we've got that, that, you know, there are studies out there like the one I just threw in the chat um, that I talked about tonight that shows they are thriving back in their homes as well. So um, don't lose sleep or don't, worst case, don't say, well, we would have to take a leg off um, and we can't return it. So we have to euthanize because we know that that's just not the case. I have a question that's probably really selfish, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> so I'm curious this group's thoughts and your thoughts on if the intake pathways would be the same that you would recommend they are the same for somebody who is um, finding a, a cat, kittens in their neighborhood, and they don't want to take them to the shelter. They don't want to necessarily get the shelter involved. So, you know, I oversee re Rehome, and right now I approve 200 cat approvals every day, profiles. Um, and I'm just thinking about this concept and perhaps if it's transferable to pet owners, where if they're listing a, an adult cat that, you know, is healthy and happy, and they're like, I found this cat, if rather than just let them list and try to rehome it, if we try to educate them on just it's fine. You know, you don't need to rehome it. It's totally okay. And if we try to apply this concept to when we see the kittens that we're like, okay, the pathway is adoption for kittens, but it's not adoption. It's just kind of leave it alone. And, and would this help um, eliminate, you know, this huge number of cats and kittens that are being on adopt pet and kind of reduce and actually show the pets that are truly in need of rehoming, not kind of um, clog up the system with cats that are perfectly fine where they're at. Yeah, yeah, we call it slowing the conveyor belts of, of cats into our shelters. But I think that would be absolutely amazing to start incorporating that. Um, I found this cat, and so I'm going to put it on rehome and try and get it an indoor home now. Um, I think that would be invaluable to have that lesson um, and, and just that, that ideology presented on a huge scale like you can do of that cat might actually have a home. We don't want to displace it and steal it from its family. Um, here's what you should do instead. Right, um, and, and again, and to Chris's point, here's how to tell if it's lost or if it is a community cat um, and not displace it, not take it away from its family um, or relocate it to another area like Charlotte talked about where things are probably even worse off there. I think that would be enormously helpful if we could start getting that built into those adoption channels that says, wait, 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 we may not need adoption here. Almost like a flow chart of, hey, I found a cat, I want to adopt it. Mm, wait, um, does it really need rescue? I think that would be enormously valuable. Yeah, I would love to see something like that integrated. And that's part of that culture shift too, of retraining people about what to do when you find a cat. Yeah, I love that concept. Um, and then the kitten aspect, we want them on the super highway to adoption, but preferably without shelter stay. They can still hit that adoption track without shelter stay. So that is, that is an important component that I'm glad you brought up, that just because they're on those super highways does not mean they have to come in my doors at the shelter. 
preferably they don't. Um, so yeah, exactly what you're doing. Here's how I, I did find the kittens. Okay, we're gonna take them away from mama at this age and, and we wanna get them adopted, but preferably they don't have to come into the shelter either. Yeah, we're really trying to open our minds this year to like, it's okay for lots of kittens to come through rehome. You know, it's it's, 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 it's acceptable, like versus like we always kind of, we all come out of sheltering. We always get this hat on of like, no, 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 they all need to be spayed, neutered, vaccinated and all these things. And so we're really trying to just make sure they're of age and they can go to the next home. Yeah, it's, I mean, we still know that, that neonate kittens are one of the highest risk groups of animals in animal sheltering. They're one of the highest um, died in care, highest euthanasia. Um, we, we, anything to keep them in a home um, is, is preferable to coming, in, coming into the shelter nine times out of 10. Um, and that's not even accounting for the fact that just cats are so unique in their stress and sickness response um, that yeah, pushing that message across of, Here's what we want to do now with a cat you found outside and the shelter should be the absolute last resort. I love that concept. And we, if we can integrate that into all of our platforms, um, I think that would be hugely advantageous to driving this, this kind of change in the way we, that this country and Canada thinks about cats. Did you like how I threw that in there, Kathy, for you? <laughs> Hey, so I have a I have a question, and I'm sorry if I missed this and you spoke on it, but of the 200 that you're having uploaded, um, how many of them are like litters where an individual is uploading multiple pets for rehoming versus individual? Right now, I would say probably 10 to 15 percent. Um, and we don't allow litters to be listed like that. We'll allow two, but we won't allow like five just because of the way like our application system works. It just creates a big mess. Um, so we send out, we send them an email basically saying how to list them individually and they always do. And so when they come back through the second time, because I'm the person who sees all of our cats right now, I'm like, oh, this is the person, you know, and, and I've also I'm becoming familiar with like lone rescuers is what they call them. So these are people who are, like they're, they're always listing litters of kittens. Um, and so rather than just like letting them continue to list a litter of kittens, like every single month, we're trying to provide a more concierge type service where we reach out to them and say, it's amazing that you're trying to help cats in your community, but well, maybe we could help you get a cat spayed. Um, so you don't have to always list kittens. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting, the volume, you know, is just like a, a really, when you recognize somebody's email, it's bad, you know? <laughs> well, it's kind of like when you worked at the front counter, you, you would see the person park their car and you're like, oh, it's Debbie again. Uh, no, but you, you really walked right in. I mean, you walked me right to my question was when you are seeing someone who is that community cat person, um, are you like connecting them with the local resources at the shelter to kind of partner that? That is awesome. Yeah, I mean, people, I don't, I don't think most people realize that Rehome, even though we are huge and we onboard 500 pets a day and there's 10,000 pets on our site, it is very concierge type because we have multiple staff members that are just looking at these profiles. So I look at all the cats. We have a full-time staff member who looks at all the dogs. Um, she spends eight hours a day looking at dogs um, and they're much more complicated because we get all the breeders and scammers that are trying to get in there, people who are trying to charge for pets. But um, it is we are trying to be more of not just a pass through, we are trying to help educate people as they're coming through because we have this, not only this opportunity, but we feel like we have a responsibility. You know, they found us, why not try to help them and try to um, change the course of, you know, that specific person in the community and, you know, however they're trying to help. So um, we are pulling data right now. So I will have some data coming out probably next month that's gonna show, our ages and we're going to start looking at you know are we seeing the same spike on rehome as every shelter sees or is it kind of the same throughout and also regionally and all that stuff we're we're becoming more and more interested in kittens probably because i have to approve every single kitten right now <laughs> that is a lot of kittens i love the concept though of kind of a, a species a different model for for different species which it seems like such an elementary statement, but it's revolutionary in animal sheltering because we've treated cats and dogs exactly the same for a hundred years now. Um, and it, it's, not, it's not working for the cat. So I love that, that, that you brought that up of, hey, should we maybe have a different kind of track or module when someone says, I found a cat and I want to get it adopted now. I love that. 
Erica, you had a question back in the chat about cats with uh, mite, mites and scabies. Did you I love them? scabies cats. Yeah, what is with all the scabies cats? I love like, them. They're my favorite. We used to never see scabies until a couple years ago, and now we get we get them in when they've already been tipped, and we get them in possibly like we just got one in last week that was already spayed. It's just the recovery is so long, and we debate: is it better to put them back, or you know, what do we do? Because it's typically not just scabies; it's like yeah. scabies and upper respiratory and mites, and the, like it's just compounding. So yeah, and that's the case with cats and all illness. Like they get one thing because their immune system is is down, and so you know now we've got ringworm, and so ringworm let the scabies in, and now we've got URIs, and now I've torn my ear up. But yeah, it it snowballs with cats so quickly. Um, but then this is what a cat nerd I am. I love scabies cats so much. I love nothing more than seeing their like bald, crusty, disgusting cat and you throw a dose of revolution on them. And like, you can see this like 24 hour by 24 hour change and they just blossom into the most beautiful creature. And like, you can just tell, oh my God, thank you for putting the revolution on me. I can stop scratching now. Like it, they're just highly rewarding for me. Um, it's, you know, I guess it would depend on the severity of, of the scabies. Like you've got a bald, torn up cat. It would probably justify for keeping for two weeks to put the second dose on, um, of topical on. But that also brings up a good point of what accommodations we can make for the, the feral or fractious cats in our shelters that's the most humane as possible. Um, and so I'm a huge advocate for outdoor housing for feral fractious cats. Um, in Austin, we've got um, a, a barn cat ISO we call it for, it's outdoor, it's an outdoor habitat for, for sick or injured um, feral cats. So they can be outside and under far less stress, um, but we can still medicate, we can hold, we can do that. So that's a great way to mitigate that if you have to. Um, put a chicken coop outside and scabies cat, you can go live in there for two weeks and not take up a shelter condo um, and have far, far less stress on you. So, and I know not everybody's got the room to do, do something like that, um, but if you do, it's an excellent use of resources to have outdoor habitat for your 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 feral fractious cats who have to live on site for one way or another for, you know, whether they're waiting for working cat placement or they're sick or injured and they, they're waiting to get better until they go back home. Um, and we've got lots of build plans on those um, that exist in Austin and how to do it on the cheap if anyone needs anything like that. Um, Catherine Reeves, you had a question about um education for for children Are you on here yeah hi um so i'm the community kids coordinator at animal care centers of new york city um, and i have to wonder sometimes if my job title was a pun um, but i do outreach with students that are under 18 um, and nearly every time I work with a group of students, their number one concern are the cats that they see in their neighborhoods, the community cats. Um, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel or anything. So that's why I was just curious if any of you have had experience working with people under 18, um, if there's any resources out there that you could recommend um, off the top of your head, maybe that are like geared towards kids. Um, so people that are too young to get involved in like, um, trap, neuter, release, things like that. Just ways to kind of help kids feel empowered that they can help and kind of just learn that it's okay to have cats outside. They don't have to be brought to shelters. In fact, as we're all saying, it's better not to have them brought to the shelters. Catherine, before we uh, open up that question, could I ask you a quick question? So when the, the youth are coming to you to have these conversations, what is the exact terminology they're using for these cats? They're saying neighborhood um, cats or outside cats, stray outside cats. cats. Yeah, they don't even really say like feral or anything. It's just very much like there's cats in my neighborhood, cats that don't have homes, homeless cats. I hear that a lot too. I think that's super interesting and also precious. Um, I am not aware of of any you know youth outreach that that looks at community or outdoor cats. Um, but I think we should create it. Like I love this idea, and we need to write like the next block busting kids book about like Billy the one-eyed outdoor cat. Um, I love this concept so much. I, I'm not, I, if anyone else is aware of anything um, that, that works with, with kids or, or youth or anything like that, I would love to know. I'm not aware of it, but it should exist. I wonder I to do this growing. So now I did unmute. So I wonder if on the Cincinnati project, they have the kind of like the pet um, scooter the cat yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, and they have a lot of videos on YouTube and on social um, that kind of explain what TNR is and the whole process, but it's done through the, the, the figure of this cartoon cat. So those might be some some resources to, to use. I think I used to live in New York City. I think also like the bodega cats of New York City and like yeah. using those as an example are always just a fun way of explaining that outdoors are part of our community. <laughs> Could you repeat the, the first group that you said? Cincinnati, I think? Um, it's it's called the 10 movement. Well, there, that's a separate movie, That's it, but it was um, Scooter, the neuter, the neutered cat, I think. Neuter the neutered cat, and it's a hu huge. It went viral in Cincinnati, and it's a huge, um, a huge initiative from uh, the Joni Bernard Foundation. Out of okay, Cincinnati. thank you. Yeah, um, and again, we're going to do a webinar with their founder or their CEO on June seventeenth. Great, thank um, you. I appreciate it. I'm going to throw my email address in the chat really quick in case anyone has additional questions for me or needs anything from me, so you can reach me. This has been wonderful. We um, ha have so many great questions. Um, appreciate it. Yeah, I was telling Kelly Dewar, I was like, when I found out Monica Frenin was on, I literally just opened up some popcorn and watched the show. So we appreciate you, Monica. Thanks to Maddie for being able to create this space. And uh, Kelly, do you know who we have speaking next week? Um, we're about to talk about it, I think. It, it might be, we haven't decided yet. Got it. So, we, so will be, yeah. we will see you all here next week anyway, because it's not about the topic. It's about the community. Thank yes. you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, all. <laughs>